Dan Dicka with the Bulldog broadcast here for the Field of 68 Media Network. Just a quick recap uh, over the last week of Gonzaga games. Uh, and really, quite frankly, um, I don't need to say much about the Texas game because I'm sure everybody saw it. Um, Drew Timmy's dominant performance, 37 points, 15 of 19 from the field. I mean, he literally took away Texas's will early in the game. Uh, he made it. Uh, he made it absolutely clear that he was the best player on the floor that night he was going to dominate that gonzaga was going to win texas did make a nice little mini run towards towards the end to kind of make it somewhat interesting but at the end of the day tremendous performance from him great performance from gonzaga i think the thing that uh i was most impressed about uh was the fact that drew timmy or excuse me chet holmgren didn't force the issue somebody who is you know, talked about as the number one pick in the NBA draft or, or being kind of uh, in, in that conversation. Many times your first chance to play in, the, in front of the amount of NBA scouts that were there the other night, I heard there was 25 to 30 NBA scouts. Um, it would have been very easy for him to press and try to make plays or, or try to get in on the action, so to speak. But he really didn't do that. He recognized early and realized that it was Drew Timmy's night. And he didn't try to impose his own piece to the game at all. He, he did a really good job, I thought, uh, just playing within himself. And I thought that was really impressive. I think that shows a ton of IQ. That shows a lot of character. That shows the ability for him to really understand the game and, and maybe where he fits at that point in time in a particular game. I'm sure there's going to be opportunities this year where the tables are flipped and he's the guy that's having an unbelievable breakout game. Um, so I think I was really impressed with Chet, Chet Holmgren in, in those regards. They then played Alcorn State. They did a really nice job. Uh, you know, Many times after a big win like the one against Texas, it can be easy to kind of let down. Um, Alcorn State came in, played, played tough. They were quick. They were athletic. Um, they tried to climb up defensively into Gonzaga, and I thought Gonzaga did a nice job of, uh, of just taking care of business and getting better um, that night. Looking forward to this end-of-week game against Bellarmine. That one's going to be interesting. Myself and the regional TV crew, we've got the game. we got the call for KHQ and Root Sports here on the, in the Northwest. But um, that game is going to be interesting. Most people uh, don't know much about Bellarmine. They've been one of the most efficient offenses over the last few years. Um, and, and it's not the type of offense that maybe many people are expecting to see, where there's post-ups, where there's dribble drive action, where there's pick and rolls. They actually run the fewest amount of pick and rolls uh, per game in the country. They have a very pass dominant offense. They track the amount of passes, um, which many teams do. But uh, for example, a, a lot of teams would set a goal of let's get 200 passes. So we really get the ball popping and moving, uh, getting it side to side that game. Well, Bellardman takes it to another level. They'll have possessions where they may not dribble the ball as soon as the offense is initiated in the front court. Obviously, you got to bring the ball up by dribbling it. Uh, but once you get into the past half court, there might be one more dribble, and that's it, the whole entire possession. They've had games charted, Bellarmine has, where there's been over 350 passes. So just something to keep an eye on. There's lots of different actions uh, that are going to happen, scissor cut actions, back screen, double back screen actions to get guys on the block or get free them up on the perimeter for jump shots. Uh, I think this is a tremendous test for Gonzaga's youth to be able to lock in on a scouting report in practice, in shoot around, and execute it during a game. So uh, that's something that I'm keeping my eye on. I think it's going to be fascinating to watch on Friday night's game. Before we move on to the next topic, let me tell you guys a little bit about our partners over at Bet Rivers Sportsbook. If you haven't signed up with Bet Rivers yet, now's the time because they are offering a $250 match bonus for your first deposit. But what sets them apart is that they require just one playthrough to turn your bonus into cash money. With their new Rush Pay instant approval, withdrawing your winnings is safer, more secure, and more reliable. With basketball season tipping off, get in on the action by going to betrivers.com today or by downloading the BetRivers iOS app. Must be 21 years or older. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. 
today's guest, another transfer who took advantage of an opportunity in Spokane and made the most of it, has been playing professionally in Europe for a number of years, is actually back in Spokane right now, healing up from an injury, the great Eric McClellan. Eric, how goes life as you're kind of healing up with that injury right now? Uh, first off, uh, thank you for having me. I'm super excited to be here, Dan. Uh, I don't know about the great part, but, uh, whenever I'm back in Spokane, um, you know, it's always love here. The people, uh, it just fits my vibe. It fits my energy. Um, I just love it here. It's my second home. So obviously rehabbing the injury sucks, but it's all good. Well, we're going to get back to that great adjective because I, I, I am being truthful when I say this. You were spectacular down the stretch uh, your senior year in helping Gonzaga, you know, really finish with a flourish that year. We'll touch on that in a moment, but you're an Austin, Texas native. The Zags just absolutely put a beat down uh, on your hometown, Texas Longhorns. What was that like for you? And, and were you texting with buddies from back home? Absolutely. I mean, um, since we got the schedule, uh, my friends from back home, I, I call them my enemies. So my friends from back home, uh, they had this one pinned down on the calendar, and so did I. I. I mean, I couldn't wait. I didn't know whether or not I'd be able to make the game, of course, but the atmosphere was crazy. I thought the guys played really, really well. Um, and to come out like that against, you know, the number five ranked team in, uh, in the nation, I mean, it's a testament to their diligence, their hard work, uh, their character. I mean, I know – I know how much they work here, so it's not a surprise. But uh, to look that good early on in the season, um, I was impressed. You started your career at Tulsa, which is a for, – for Zag fans that don't follow college basketball outside of Gonzaga pretty closely, it's a good program. Um, you were off to a good career. You had some off-the-court issues that we don't need to, to get into. Uh, but you needed a new setting. You needed a new uh, home. Gonzaga has been a perfect second home for a lot of guys, myself included. What went into the transfer process for you to come to Gonzaga? What were the selling points and how did that come about? So initially, as you stated, I started at Tulsa. Um, I wasn't a highly recruited um, player coming out of high school. I actually got all my, uh, or received all my scholarships, all my offers, my spring or the spring spring of my senior year um and I tell my guys all the time like my high school team uh, teammates you guys got me a scholarship because I was like the second third option um uh within these programs so uh I attended Tulsa and the only reason why I left Tulsa was because my coaching staff got fired at the end of our season so I had no idea what the transfer uh transfer portal would be like I had um you know, and I had reservations about leaving as well. You know, I was I was afraid of leaving my teammates, my friends, all the relationships that, you know, I curated over the course of that year. Um, but the my assistant coach that actually recruited me to Tulsa, he was at Vandy at the time. So um, I had a few schools lined up to, to visit. And then um, on the spot at Vanderbilt, which was my first visit, I decided to uh, commit on the spot. Obviously, two years down the road, um, I get dismissed from school. And at the time, I had no idea what was going to happen. You know, and it's rare that players, especially collegiate athletes, get third acts. And at every level, I seem to, you know, be in a better situation, so to speak. Um, so I was in Michigan training, just staying out of trouble. I was away from home. Um, applied my next move and Tommy actually, Tommy was the one that reached out to us and he started our recruitment. And other schools were involved and other schools were interested, but no one worked harder for my future than Gonzaga. And I had to do a lot, but the people here helped me so much. You know, the infrastructure here, the resources, um, and it was genuine. It was genuine. They told me straight up what I had to do. Um, what was needed for me and I was all in. I bought in, I was all in. I was excited about the new opportunity and turns out it was everything that I needed for my growth and aspiration process. And, you know, I, I, I'm on record saying this and I say this a lot, but I'm truly, truly grateful. Um, and that's why this university means so much to me, just, you know, being close to the 
to the staff, the administration, um, the players, the students. Uh, whenever I can, I wear Gonzaga stuff. Whenever I get to speak about Gonzaga, I love to um, I love to communicate about Gonzaga because this place gave me everything. I feel like, and um, like I said, staying close to the university means a lot to me. It's yeah, I think it's a beautiful thing how, you know, a guy like yourself from Austin, Texas now calls Spokane home in their in your off season. I didn't grow up in Spokane. I live here now. So many guys have a similar experience where they just love being around their teammates. They love the university. They move back. When you look at your team, is there anybody that is not living in Spokane now that you say, I guarantee you when they're done with their playing career, they are moving back to Spokane? <laughs> so I have a funny story. Um, you know, my teammates know this story and, and some of my close friends, but I remember my first week here in Spokane, uh, me and Byron Wesley, we just turned uh, touring campus and uh, we kept hearing about all you guys coming back to live here. You know, guys from Louisiana, like Rob, LA, New York, Seattle. And I'm from Austin and Byron's from LA and we're looking at each other like, who would come to live here, dude? Like, who would come back to live here? And then being being a part of it for two years and then being uh, now five years removed from it, you just totally get it. You know what I mean? Like, like I said it before, the, the people, the people in this town, like, they, they, they curate the culture. Um, and it's just, you know, for me, especially in the summer, like, you have everything. You have Quarter Lane, you have the lakes, you have the weather, um, you have hoops everywhere. I mean, you know about the Stockton Run, the warehouse, um, obviously guys at GU. So everything that I need and everything I'm focused on, it only makes sense to be here, you know. And like I said, these relationships mean a lot to me. Um, I've been able to cultivate some beautiful, beautiful Fox relationships, and, you know, I don't take them for granted. You mentioned that Tommy Lloyd reached out to you in, in that kind of uh, period where you were trying to figure out your next steps after leaving Vanderbilt. He has been instrumental in so many guys. Uh, he's got his first opportunity as a head coach at Arizona. What do you? What are your thoughts on that? Are you, obviously, you know, I'm torn because I would love to see Tommy still here in Spokane, but he's earned an opportunity. What are your thoughts on Tommy at Arizona? When I first got the news, I, it was bittersweet and it was kind of numbing because I knew I wouldn't see him as much, um, especially when I came back in the summer. And then. Um, Unselfishly, I was super happy for him and his family, you know, Chanel, Liam, Sophia, Mimi. I mean, I'm very, very close to them, you know. Um, their children are, are like my brothers and sisters, and then Chanel's like my mom. I mean, what they mean to me is a lot, and that's why it was so tough. But in terms of him, I mean, you don't get these opportunities a lot, and I can't see him leaving Gonzaga with Sal, you know, without an opportunity like this presenting itself, you know what I mean? And as far as his success, I think, you know, I think they're 3-0 and right now, maybe, 2-0, and 3-0. and I didn't think there was going to be, um, uh, what's the term I'm looking for? A lot of hardship. You know, I thought he was going to hit the ground running. You know, he's going to take a lot of the things that make Zagger great over the two two decades plus. And, you know, instilling in, uh, still in the players down there. So, you know, I know he's a culture builder. He's a relationship foster. He's going to be great. I'm super excited for him. Yeah, it's going to be fun watching him uh, get Arizona back to the level that I think is good for, for West Coast basketball and uh, NCAA basketball. Because when Arizona, UCLA are good, it really helps the West Coast brand. Uh, as long as Gonzaga stays at the peak, at the top, which is where we're, we've been at for a number of years, I had Gino Crandall on uh, last year, and I asked him a question about Coach Few has a, ha, at times can be very sarcastic to guys, and for guys that transfer in, you know, sometimes it catches them off guard. And he told a great story about him really finally getting to know Coach Few and, and his approach to things. Do you have any funny or odd Coach Few stories? Odd? I mean, you know, I think it's a typical – uh athlete coach relationship while you're here 
you know, when you see them in a hall, like you act like you're on your phone or you you, you turn away because the, <laughs> the encounter is awkward at times. And then, I mean, in practice, he's intense. Um, he's never disrespectful, though. You know, he's going he's gonna to challenge you. Um, but he also likes it when you're competitive and you give it back to him, you know, and he'll be the first to stand up and say, my bad or good job or that's what you do, right? Um, I've had coaches who cross boundaries. I've had coaches who were verbal abusers. Um, I've had coaches that had players fall out of love with basketball because of their style of coaching. That wasn't Coach Hugh at all. Like, Coach Hugh is a nurturer. He's a servant leader. Um, and he wants the best for us. And now that I'm a professional, I'm out of Gonzaga. Like, when I come back, we talk about everything. Like, we talk about politics. We talk about science. We talk about entertainment. Um, we talk about hoops. And it's, it's not awkward at all. It's like he's one of us, you know. And for us to have that relationship with Coach Few, and he wants it, like, it's nothing, it's nothing we can ask for, you know, because he will run through a brick wall for us and um, it goes both ways. So I love Coach Few. Um, and, you know, the, the stability he's created here, it doesn't happen without, you know, him, Hertie, uh, Mike Ross, you know, those guys, those guys built the culture. They, I mean, it trickles down and it's a testament to just who they are as people. Yeah, it's a, a great how you share kind of the evolution of, of your relationship with Coach Few. So many guys have, have said similar things. With your experience with Coach Few, with Tommy, um, do you have any passion to get into coaching when you're done playing? That's such a good question, man. I mean, I've been on – I think I've been on record saying that, you know, I have no interest in coaching. But, you know, that was years ago. And then, like – you know, I come back in the summer and I train kids and I found a passion and love for that, just uh, paying it forward to some degree and um, giving a little bit of knowledge that I have. And I've seen, you know, I've seen the kids that I've trained over the course of two or three years grow and blossom into the best version of themselves. And um, I love it. I love that feeling. So uh, I haven't thought about it much, but um, it could be something down the line that, you know, I look towards and I mean, I'm eager and excited about. So uh, who knows? We'll see. I like that. Leave the door open. That's the best way to put it because uh, you still got a number of good years professionally ahead of you. Um, and I think it's important to play until you no longer have that passion to, to work out daily. Tell us a little bit about a couple of the places that you've played uh, professionally over in Europe and then where you're at now with your rehab and looking to get back over there. Yeah, so I played, uh, I played in Austria, I played in Greece, I played in Germany, uh, I played in Belgium, I played in Lithuania, uh, and I played in Mexico. And I was probably one or two weeks out, I was at Gonzaga actually working out um, with another pro and made just a normal basketball play, just stripped at the ball. I was on defense, just stripped at the ball. And uh, the player just finished through the contact, kind of. And I knew something was wrong, but I just kept working out, uh, kept working out, thinking that the pain was going to subside during the workout. And then another play that was identical, I did the exact same thing at the end of our workout. And that's when I knew something was wrong. So I went in, got MRIs, x-rays, and they said that uh, I had fractured, well, broke my hand, and it would be about two, two and a half months. So I actually get my spin off this Friday. Um, hopefully begin rehab next week and then probably in two weeks, you know how it is, probably in two weeks, one time 80 to 100 percent. Then I just wait on my agent to call me and bring the best opportunity to the forefront. Yeah, and, and for a lot of people listening to this that don't know much about European basketball, you might get a phone call and you're on a flight across the Atlantic within the next 36 <laughs> hours. Literally just have your passport ready at all times. I played, I had two separate stints in Europe, a short one in Italy, a short one in Germany, both ended with injuries. I had one chance to match up against a former Gonzaga a Bulldog uh, when I was in Germany. I was hurt, so I didn't play that game, but Derek Ravio uh, was on the opposing team. Have you matched up against any former Zags or teammates over there? 
dude. So I've been very, very fortunate to not only match up against former Zach, but also play with him. So in Austria, I played with Jeremy Jones. And that was a great experience. We did really well with each other um, and we played well. And the team was successful. Uh, and that was actually the COVID year. We didn't even get to finish our year. Um, and then my rookie year, I played against Stephen Gray in Greece. And that was like my introduction. And I mean, <laughs> his team killed us. Uh, we were one of those teams on like the verge of being relegated. So we we're like always at eighth or ninth seed. Um, his team was really good and he played really well as well. So um, yeah, man, I've been very fortunate to match up uh, with former guys and they look great. Um, and then also play with them. I mean, it's a, there's a lineage and there's a fraternity that we're all a part of. And, to see guys still playing at a high level. I love it. Yeah, it's fun. Uh, occasionally I'll get on Eurobasket.com and, and check out uh, the stats for what some of you guys are doing. Um, that's a wealth of resources. Sometimes you can go down that rabbit hole and start looking at stats for, you know, five, six, seven, eight years ago. Um, but it's fun because I like uh, keeping in track of you guys to uh, as much as I can. So this year, Second year in a row, Gonzaga's preseason number one. We all know the disappointing loss in the title game um, against Baylor. But you got to give Baylor credit because they, they really played well in that game. What's your take on this year's team? Because um, I personally think they're as talented as any roster that Gonzaga ever, has ever put together. But the room for growth is off the charts as well. Like they could become a juggernaut by the end of the year. Give us your take. I mean, you just hit the nail right on the head. I mean, I think the the points that you brought up are all valid. You know, I've been fortunate enough to, you know, work out with these guys and see them practice and see their practice habits, um, see how they work work out individually. And they're skilled at every position. Every position they're skilled, and you know that, um, you know, the way that they're coached is going to be, you know, a dog fight, no pun intended, every every night. Um, you know, they have the, the best PG in the nation, you know, and I'm biased, but I've seen these guys work. They have the best PG in the nation. They have a shooter and uh, Razier. I mean, I've worked out with this dude and he's one of the best shooters I've ever seen. Like he's up there with like Kyle Wilcher, Gary Bell, uh, Kevin Pangos. He's that type of shooter. And then you have guys like Julian um, that are eager to prove themselves. Um, obviously Drew is solidified and Chet, he's coming into his own as well. So, I mean, I'm excited for this whole team. I think the defensive potential for this team is off the charts. I think they're super athletic. Um, they're rangy. They cover for each other. They communicate well. We saw it against Texas when they lock in defensively. I mean, oof. When you can score the ball that efficiently and do the same thing, if not better, on the other end, I don't see why they can't have another run um, like they did last year. Or, you know, and last year's team was – incredible I mean incredible but this team is just as deep they're just as skilled they're just as talented and I think if they're they're able to stay healthy throughout the um you know tenure of the season I don't see why they can't have another great run well I'm right there with you pulling for another great run for the guys to stay healthy and, and, and maximize their potential Eric I really appreciate the time uh, anytime I get a chance to have a, a former player on it's great to hear their experiences with uh, the staff with the community. I wish you nothing but the best of luck getting healthy and, and having a great uh, end to your season over in Europe when you finally get a chance to get over there. So thanks again. Absolutely, brother. Thank you so much. Coming from a legend like you, I'm glad we got to communicate, got to chop it up for a bit. Um, thank you so much. I'll see you soon.